When I, I live in the United States, sometimes young people come and tell me, uh, Ustad, it's really hard to be Muslim in America. And I say, I've never heard something more ridiculous in my life. If our Islam, in the millions, hundreds of millions, billions of Muslims around the world, if the vast majority of us will only be Muslim because our parents are Muslim, because our environment is Muslim, then our Islam is in trouble. Our Islam is in trouble because the environment is changing. For many centuries before the coming of the Prophet wasallam, and before the revelation of the Quran, the world operated in a certain way. And there are some things that I want to bring to your attention and to remind myself of that dominated the world. This was part of the Christian way of doing things, but it was also found in other civilizations, the Chinese civilization, the Indian civilization, the Persians, etc. They had a certain way of organizing their societies. I'll give the Christian example. What they had set up was this idea that some people are meant to rule. Some people are born of royal blood. And God wants these people to be the rulers of the land. And the fact that they have power itself means that's how Allah wants that to be. This is how Allah wants them. This, they, they are special people. They are, they're not special because of something they do. They're special just because of what bloodline they have. Just by being born, they're special. They're better than the common person. The second part of this society structure was that they felt that there are some people in society that are chosen by God. These are the holy people, the saints, the priests, the church clergy, and these are the only people who understand who God really is. Nobody else can understand. These are the people who understand religion. These are the people who understand the will of God. And these are the only people that can speak on behalf of God. If somebody disagrees with them, then they are not just committing a crime against another person. They're disagreeing with a person. They're disagreeing with God himself. And these two, the, so there was this, there was the royal elite, and then there was the spiritual elite, the spiritual elite. And these two elites, they worked with each other. They had a partnership. So the spiritual elite would go and give their sermon and preach to the people, you better be loyal to the king because God chose that king. So he, they're going around and making sure everybody is, stays loyal to the ruling class. And the ruling class says, we will... He, the ruling class comes to the spiritual lead and says, we will fund your church, we will protect you, we will make sure everybody listens to you, and if every, anybody disagrees with you, we will have them killed. We will protect you in that way. So everybody will follow you, and you tell everybody to follow us. This, this is the setup that they created. And then there was a third class of people. So this was the political elite, the royal elite, and there was the spiritual elite, and then there was the financial elite, the people with money. And it was this idea that some people just, oh, you know, God has just blessed some people to be more wealthy than other people. And clearly, if he gave them so much, that must mean he likes them more than other people. They are meant to be the masters. They are meant to be the owner of the land. They are meant to be the one that has all the money. And we're meant to serve them. This is our place in the world. So there was this... You can call it a trinity, an unholy trinity in society. There was the rulers, there was the spiritual elite, and there was the financial, the wealthy elite. And then the rest of them were called the commoners. The rest of us are the commoners, right? And our job is to accept these people's place, and our job is to accept our role in society. That's, that's, the, that's the role we were brought into in this world. This is where you were born. Now, this is the Christian version of things, but the Chinese have their own version of things, and the Hindus have their own versions of things, and the, the Zoroastrians have their own versions of things, but they all have something in common. Even back, all the way, go back to the Fir'aun, you see the same formula. Fir'aun believes that he's God. He's chosen by God. He's from the royal blood. He has a priest class that goes around teaching that you have to be royal to the Pharaoh. <laughs> And then they have the business class that take advantage of all the other workers at the bottom. This is a setup. 
and all three support each other, and the law doesn't apply equally to people that belong in this class. So if a common person commits a crime, they will be punished. But if a member of one of these three groups commits a crime, then they will protect each other, and they will find some way of not getting these people punished like other people get punished. This is, a, this is part of the system. But they're, they're going to preach to people that the laws apply for everyone, but of course they don't apply for people that are above the law, and these three groups are above the law. And this, even, even this setup existed in Mecca at the time of the Prophet ﷺ in their own way. The Quraysh believed that they were the chosen custodians of the Kaaba, the royals of Mecca. They were actually, they, they also happen to have people of different religious classes, different idols, different religions, and all of them are endorsing the Meccans. All of them. Don't mess with the Meccans. These are the protected people. That's why if, when the Meccans would travel for business, nobody would attack them. Because they are being protected by the spiritual class. And of course, they're also the ones making all the money. When the Qur'an came, when Allah gave His final revelation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was actually from the very beginning a revolution. Allah is teaching us that there's no one to be worshipped except Him. And that He created all human beings from one single human being, from Adam alayhi salam. Which means the royal blood and the farmer's blood and the slave's blood, and the master's blood, and the rich person's blood, and the poorest person's blood, is just the blood of Adam alayhi salam. There's no difference. And when they're going to pray to, to Allah, there's not going to be a row for the royals, then the second row for the spiritual elite, and the third row for the wealthy elite, and then the poor people can be in the back. It's not how it works. When the Muslims are standing for salah, someone belonging to a higher tribe like Hamza radiallahu anhu is standing in the same row as Bilal radiallahu anhu, who's supposed to be a slave. They're all standing in the same row. All of a sudden, he's not just talking about equality in, in theory. He's showing it every single salah. When the Muslims are standing together, is showing that all human beings are equal. You leave whatever title somebody had, if they were a royal, they were a scholar, they were a business person, they were, you know, some, some governor, whatever they were outside, they, they take those shoes off. They take those shoes off and they come inside Allah's house and they're just Allah's worshippers. That's it, they're equal completely. There is no hierarchy between them. And the, there's a new hierarchy in the Quran. There is such a thing as some people are better than others. There is such a thing. But how does the Quran define it? The most noble among you, know, the word noble is very important because when the Arabs heard the word noble, what came in their mind? These three kinds of nobles came in their mind. The three kinds that I keep describing you. And Allah says the most noble among you are the ones who are most aware of Allah, most conscious of Allah, most mindful of Allah. So now, how do you determine someone is better? The one that is actually more loyal to Allah, more loyal to justice, more loyal to principles, more loyal to truth and to honesty. The person that is kinder is better. The person that is more truthful is better. The person that is giving the rights to their family is better. It doesn't matter if they're a billionaire or they're homeless, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what blood they came from, what color of their skin, that doesn't matter. Because taqwa is inside, it's not outside. So what they're wearing on the outside, the skin on the outside, the accomplishments, the recognition, all of these things that are from the outside, in a sense, before Allah became irrelevant. All of that became irrelevant. Guys, sorry for the interruption in the middle of this lecture. Just before you continue, I want to let you know and encourage you that I want you to sign up for BayinaTV.com and help others sign up or even sponsor students for BayinaTV.com so we can create worldwide communities of students that are studying the meanings and the benefit and the wisdom of the Qur'an uh, and are inshallah ta'ala spreading that in their own circles. Thanks so much. And in fact, a lot of these people, the elites, one thing you know about the elites is that they, they love having servants. They don't like doing things themselves. Do you imagine some king sitting there going, and then the guy brings water, and somebody brings some fruit, and somebody's giving him the fan. 
Or if he hears a noise outside, he says, guards, go check, go check. He's not going to get up and check himself. He's going to go tell somebody else to check, right? And what does Allah do in the Quran? He talks to these elites. By the way, much of the Meccan Quran, if you read it carefully, the early revelations in the Quran is talking to the elite, is going after them, going after the wealthy, going after the powerful. And Allah says on Judgment Day, what happened to your security? Where, where's your servants? Why are you alone? And then he's about to be humiliated on judgment day. And Allah says, Look, innaka anta al-azizul kareem. You know, Allah says, Ma'alahum min duni min wali, wala nasir. They're not going to have a protector, no helper. You see, when the king would get in trouble, he'd go to the church. When the church would go to trouble, they'd go to the king. When both of them got in trouble, they'd go to the wealthy. They would find each other's help. Judgment day comes. He's like, where's my people? Hello, who I got to call? I, I don't have anybody to go back to. The Quran was destroying, destroying the recognition of this hierarchy. All human beings are equal. All human beings deserve dignity. Nobody's born in a lesser class. Nobody deserves less respect because they have less money. Nobody deserves more respect because they have more power. That's not the case. Respect, karam, comes from taqwa. Respect comes from somewhere else completely, completely. And this was a very, it sounds like a beautiful idea, but it's also a really dangerous idea. It's actually a truly, truly dangerous idea. Because if you accept this idea, then you cannot just tell people what to do and they will not question you. Because if I tell you something, you have a right to ask me a question. Hey, that doesn't make sense. I can question you. Where did you get this from? What's your evidence? How to burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen? Bring your evidences. But if you're the church or if you're the spiritual elite and you speak on behalf of God and you can never even be questioned, nobody can even ask you a question because questioning you is the same as questioning God himself. Well, that image is shattering. This is why you find in our tradition, the Muslim scholarly tradition is very different from the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition and other traditions. In our scholarly tradition, one scholar would write a tafsir of the Quran. And another scholar will write another tafsir of the Qur'an and will debate the opinion of the first scholar and say, he wrote this, and here's why I disagree with him. And nobody looks at that and says, look at this, kufr. How could he disagree with this name? How could he just, no, nobody's a pope. Nobody's holy. These are all human beings making their best attempt to understand the word of Allah. And they can disagree with each other. They can have debates with each other. And this is actually the power of our religion. The other interesting thing that happened in the time before Islam was nobody had access to the Bible. You couldn't just pick up the Bible and read it. You have to go to the proper authority. They will tell you what it says. People didn't actually have a copy of the Torah and the Injil among them. They didn't have that. They knew some basic du'as and the prayers, but the, the text was in the possession of the church. The text was in the possession of the rabbis. When Allah gave us the final revelation, He didn't give it in the form of a text that is supposed to be preserved somewhere hidden, only to be kept, to be accessed by the very special few. The Quran was memorized and the Quran was spread by the tongue and any ear could hear it. It's no longer classified information. Everybody has access. And this was actually a revolution by itself. Everybody has access to education. Everybody has access to Allah's words. Everybody should be thinking about Allah's words. And then they should be going to those who know, know more than them and learning, hey, what does this mean? What does this mean? And they should be inquiring. They should be think thoughtful believers. They shouldn't just be believers because somebody told them to be believers. They should be believers on their own. This was a profound revolution. This is actually the revolution of Islam. That's what the Prophet ﷺ brought. I say this to you because we're living at a certain time in history. It's been, you know, a, a thousand and a half years, 1500 almost years since the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. So it's been a long time. Like the Quran describes about the people before us. A long time has passed over them. 
What happens over time? What happens over time is we forget some of the things that were there in the beginning. We become a culture. Just like every other religion became a culture. We're born into a Muslim family. We're born into a Muslim community. We're, we're used to you know, things being a certain way. We never ask any questions. We never inquire. And we're just, past, we accept Islam because our environment is Islamic. Please listen to this carefully. We accept Islam because we found in our family or in our community an Islamic environment. So our Islam didn't come from the inside. It came from the environment, which is outside. But what, now we're, times have changed even if you're living in Trinidad, or you're living in Texas, or you're living in Lahore, or you're living in Dhaka, I don't care where you're living in the world, your environment is not just a physical environment. There's an environment on this device right here. There's an environment right here. You are now exposed to things you were never exposed to. Human beings were never exposed this way before, ever. So your environment that kept you safe, and you could just be comfortable in your belief, because everybody around you believes the same way you do. It's no longer the case. It's being challenged. It's being questioned. It's being, it's being made confusing. Now you have two choices. If, if you want to save your iman, you want to save your faith, you have two choices. I'm going to shut down the internet. I don't want, I'm going to shut down all world communication. Don't talk to anybody. I just want to stay within the few people that will protect my iman. Everything else is fitna. Everything else is kufr. Everything else will destroy me. By the way, several, a couple of thousand years ago, the church was telling the public, don't learn, don't ask questions, don't inquire, because if you learn anything outside, it will ruin your faith. It will ruin your faith. That, that's what the church was telling the people. Don't learn. That's why they were burning books. They were burning books because they didn't want people to learn. Because if people learn, they'll start questioning Christianity. We can't have that. That will destroy this whole system. And so if our solution is we better not learn anything, we better, we better hide to protect our iman, we are forgetting who we are. Allah gave us this religion not to hide from the environment. Allah gave us this religion to challenge the environment. That's actually why he gave us this religion. This religion doesn't run from fitna. This religion ends fitna. This is what this deen is. This is why Allah calls it the religion, the deen, of, or the millah of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam was surrounded by shirk. And he's constantly questioning it. He's constantly asking questions and he's challenging it. We cannot become the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam if we don't have something inside that is driving our iman. And the thing that, just, just contemplate this with me, the, the Muslims that first heard the Qur'an, the people who first heard the Qur'an, and we, we often don't think about this, when the Qur'an was coming down, the vast majority of people that were listening to the Qur'an were not Muslim. When the Qur'an was first being revealed, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was reciting the ayat of the Qur'an, most of the ears that the Qur'an was going into was not Muslims. And they've been not Muslims for many centuries. Family history and ancestry and Every ayah of the Qur'an is challenging their culture, it's challenging their family, it's challenging their environment, it's challenging their lifestyle, it's challenging their freedom, it's challenging everything. Why would they leave their family and their culture and their freedom and their comfort, or leave all of that and accept this message? What is it? It's something powerful about the word of Allah. There's something supernatural miraculous about the word of Allah, that these people who heard it, imagine before Islam, they could eat whatever they want. They could do whatever they want. They can kill whoever they want. They can behave however they want. They can speak whatever they want. And Islam comes and it puts restrictions on what they can eat and who they can marry and how they can behave and how they can do business. Why am I accepting all these restrictions? I was free before. Why am I following this? This is too restricting. By the way, you get this question today from Muslim youth. Muslims say Islam is so strict. It's so restricting. And I say, your, your question is not new. In fact, this question would have been asked by the mushrik a couple of thousand years ago. 
or 1,500 years ago when the Quran first came. Why should I accept this religion that puts all these restrictions on me when I could be free without it? Shirk is so much easier. Being, shirk is much more liberal than Islam. It's too conservative, right? The question then is, how, why did they accept it? Why not? They didn't just accept it. They're willing to die for it. They're being tortured and beaten, and you can't beat the Islam out of them. They're being ripped apart, and they won't leave la ilaha illallah. What in the world is happening here? Even their family comes to them and says, we liked you. Kunta fina marjua. We used to like you. We had hopes in you. Why are you becoming like this? What's changed inside you? Something came inside them that they could see the falsehood outside. And now they're committed to the truth. This will only happen when someone has basira on the inside. They can see for themselves, this is the word of Allah. They can feel for themselves, this is the word of Allah. If our Islam, in the millions, hundreds of millions, billions of Muslims around the world, if the vast majority of us will only be Muslim because our parents are Muslim, because our environment is Muslim, then our Islam is in trouble. Our Islam is in trouble because the environment is changing. And when the environment changes, then the Islam will change too. The thing that will keep our Islam going even if the outside situation changes or doesn't change, nothing will impact it, is if our Islam is coming from inside, not from the outside. It's from the inside. When I, I live in the United States, sometimes young people come and tell me, uh, Ustad, it's really hard to be Muslim in America. And I say, I, I've never heard something more ridiculous in my life. It's very hard to be Muslim in America. When two plus two equals four, it's not hard to accept that 2 plus 2 equals 4 in Trinidad, and it's not much harder in Canada, and not much harder in <laughs> anywhere else. Fire burns. Uh, it's really hard to not touch fire in America. No, no, no. Fire burns no matter where fire is, buddy. Truth is truth. The idea that somehow the environment is making my faith weak, you know what that means? That your, your faith just came from the environment. That's why it's weak. Your faith didn't come from something inside. We need to cultivate that inside. We need to build that inside. And the only way that will come, the only way that will come is the way that it came the first time. The first time it came, it came when people were thinking about what Allah was saying. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was reciting the ayat of the Quran. People were thinking about what, what, what is this word? What is he saying? And the more they were thinking about it, their entire world was changing. Then you could make the environment feel like a glimpse of hell. They won't leave Islam. You could make the environment torturous for them. They won't leave Islam. You could make them leave their home. They won't leave Islam. You could make their loved ones become their hated ones. They won't leave Islam. Nothing can happen that they will, that will make them leave Islam. So when you, when you see today that life is easier for Muslims, and by the way, when you go to Muslim, I've been in many places in the world, and when I see Muslim communities, one thing I've noticed is whenever I see more wealthy Muslims, wealthier Muslims, their children are farther away from Islam, generally. Isn't that the opposite? You have, on the one hand, you have people that are being tortured, and they won't leave Islam. And on the other hand, you have people that have a good life. They've got a PlayStation 5 downstairs and a PlayStation 5 upstairs. They've got, life is easy. Life is, they've got, got the newest iPhone, got the hi-fi internet, Wi-Fi, you know, got a car in the, couple of cars in the garage. Life is good. And all of a sudden, I have doubts about Islam. What in the world has happened? You know what's happened? Well, when your environment, the, the mentality is, I have everything I need. I have money. I have entertainment. I have health. I have safety. Why do I need God? Why do I need religion? I have everything already. I don't need it. You know where that sense of safety comes from? It comes from the environment. It comes from the environment. So now people are losing their faith because of the environment. Or people are thinking that the only way their, their faith will be safe is because of the environment. Let's get away. Let's run away from America. Let's move somewhere in the Muslim country so we'll be in a safe environment. This entire thinking goes against the message of the Qur'an. Our deen did not push people to go to safe environments. Our deen pushed people to create new environments. 
to create new environments. The Sahaba left their homeland. They left the sacred land of Mecca and Medina. They left that sacred land and they ended up, some of them, in India. Some of them all the way to China. Why? Why? They should stay in a safe environment. Why are they going all the way out there? What in the world? This is the essence of our religion. And we, when we forget that essence, then there is no, in my mind, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, in my mind, there is no doubt about it. If we don't hold on to this religion for internal reasons, for deep internal reasons, then Allah replaces the ummah with others who will be better than them. إِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you turn your backs, he will replace you with people other than you, and they will not be the likes of you. They will not be like you. May Allah protect us from being replaced. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make us people who deeply connect with Allah's word genuinely. And we find that our faith and our commitment to this religion is not being impacted by the outside, but rather it's burning from inside and it glows from the inside. And in fact, instead of it, the environment changing us, we're the ones that end up changing the environment. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikil hakim.